thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we're just waiting a little bit as uh, people are just starting to log on. Sometimes it can take a minute or two for folks to log on. Um, but we will go ahead and get started introducing the webinar. So welcome to Want to Get Away, Considering Treatment Breaks in Ovarian Cancer. I'm Stephanie Boffarb, the Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Uh, before the presentation begins, I'll tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a 43-year-old nonprofit organization that has helped women and families affected by breast and ovarian cancer by offering the support of those who have been there. SHARE volunteers staff toll-free helplines, and SHARE offers telephone and in-person support groups and educational programs. All our services are free. For more information, please visit our website, sharecancersupport.org. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. When Dr. Bukanovich has finished speaking, we will begin the Q&A discussion. You're welcome to submit questions throughout the presentations, uh, throughout the presentation through the question pane in the control panel on your screen. And then we'll get to all of those at the end. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now I'd like Andrea Herzberg, our uh, SHARE's ovarian helpline coordinator, to share a few words about why Today's program is so aptly named. Greetings, everyone. As soon as I spotted the topic, want to get away, uh, considering treatment breaks in ovarian cancer, I knew I had to get away. I had to get away from the share table at a gargantuan international cancer conference to hear what Dr. Ronald Vukanovich wished to share with the hundreds of oncologists interested in his talk. And once I heard him, I knew he'd be perfect as a presenter for SHARE's fifth annual Joan Summer educational program. Here's why. Joan was a nurse and she lived with ovarian cancer for 22 years. She was diagnosed stage four as she gave birth to her third child. Those of us late stage survivors lucky enough to cross paths with Joan marveled at her wit and her grit. How did she do it? With humor, the support of her loving husband, Joe, and their candid and clear communication with her doctors. Joan was determined to raise her children to adulthood, which she did. She was one of the founding mothers of our ovarian program here at CHAIR, and she inspired and supported many, many survivors online and at the Ovarian Cancer National Alliance conferences over the years. It wasn't a walk in the park for Joan, but sometimes it was a swim with the dolphins in the Florida Keys where she loved to vacation with her family. She once told others in prolonged treatment to look at their lives as a tapestry. The front is the vibrant big picture, you enjoying life with those you love and who love you. The back is intermittent treatment, the knotted threads. Pay attention to the threads in the back if they're unraveling, but always make the front of the tapestry, living in the moment and enjoying life your top priority. Now back to Stephanie. So our presenter today is Ronald Bukanovich, the director of the Ovarian Cancer Center of Excellence at McGee Women's Research Institute. Dr. Bukanovich performs bench to bedside translational research. He has studied cancer cells from patients with ovarian cancer, identified novel basic biologic, uh, biological phenomenon, developed therapeutic approaches, and translated these findings back into clinical trials. In addition to his laboratory studies, Dr. Bukanovich has a busy clinical practice specializing in the treatment of ovarian and uterine cancers. He's currently the principal investigator of two clinical trials at the University of Pittsburgh. Now over to you, Dr. Bukanovich. All right. Well, thank you very much. I am delighted to be here, and I, I love that introduction um, because it's patients like that that really um, – motivate me to do what I do. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, my, my spin on chemotherapy holidays, kind of riffing off the Southwest tagline, want to get away, because um, we want patients to live long and well, and holidays are part of that. So um, given the holidays are coming, let's, uh, let's talk about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sorry, I'm I'm going to give just a little bit on the statistics of ovarian cancer because um, they're important and they tell us um, a lot about the disease and, and what we need to do. So the ovarian cancer statistics, unfortunately, are pretty dismal. 
Um, one in 73 women will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer in her lifetime, making, the, making it the fifth most common cancer in women. Um, there are over 22,000 women diagnosed annually uh, in the United States, and of that 22,000, about 15,000 will unfortunately die of their disease. And this makes it the third highest mortality to incidence ratio cancer out there, behind only lung cancer and pancreatic cancer. And that really says a lot because we need to do a lot better um, than we are right now. So what is the standard therapy for ovarian cancer when a woman is diagnosed? Um, typically, we combine surgery, as shown here, with our colleagues, um, and that is combined with some form of chemotherapy. Um, <clears throat> they can be done surgery first, chemotherapy second, or vice versa. Uh, clinical trials suggest they're roughly equivalent. Um, unfortunately, the chemotherapy, so the adjuvant chemotherapy that people like myself give, hasn't changed for approximately 30 years. We still use taxol and carboplatin as the critical backbone of treatment for ovarian cancer. Um, and with that not changing over 30 years, the relapse rates, the disease recurrence rate, and the cure rates haven't changed. We Now, we have added some things. We've changed the way we give chemotherapy, whether it's intraperitoneally or don't stents. So there have been some incremental benefits, but we still aren't denting the cure rate, which is what I would like to see. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about the role of extended continuous chemotherapy in the setting of recurrent disease or metastatic disease. Um, for those patients when the disease does come back, can we make patients live longer? Because really my goal is to make patients live better and longer. We'll talk about the role of maintenance chemotherapy, meaning continuing chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. And then we'll shift to newer drugs, targeted agents, biologic therapies, such as antiangiogenics and PARP inhibitors in both the metastatic and the adjuvant setting. So what are the goals of extended slash maintenance therapy? So I just told you, at least in my view, and I think generally most would agree, that the goal is to improve survival. If we're going to ask patients to take a therapy for 18, 24 months or longer, there has to be something important in it for them. And I would say the biggest thing that needs to be there is this survival goal. And so we really want to make patients live longer. Now, I would accept if we had a drug that significantly improved symptom control and quality of life, that might be a secondary endpoint, something else that would really make patients feel better while they're living. I think that would be important and may be worth considering a prolonged treatment course, or at least discussing with our patients. If we are gonna consider a maintenance therapy, what are the factors that make a good therapy? And I would say there are four things we need to consider. First, it's gotta be effective, right? So nobody wants to take a drug that's not working. And so that's gotta be number one. Second, if we're gonna ask you to do something for two years, I'd like it to be easy, preferably an oral medication. Think about breast cancer, where we ask women to take tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor for many years. It's an easy oral medication. You pick it up at CVS or Rite Aid. Right? Those are easy things to do. Low side effects. So we'd like the drug to make patients should feel well while they're on that medication. If you feel like you've got the flu for your entire life, do you really wanna be on that medication? And lastly, it should be relatively low cost, right? We can't have patients taking drugs that cost tens and tens of thousands of dollars for for many, many years, or we're going to break the bank, and it's going to, many patients just can't afford even the co-pays that go along with that. So those are kind of the, the things that I'm going to use as we're going to go through, and we'll do some check boxes and see for the different drugs we talk about, are they effective? Before we can start looking at some of this data, so I know that Patients are smart and savvy. And so I'm gonna give you a talk that I give to my fellows because I know patients can handle it and people can handle it, family members. Um, you just need to know the lingo. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of the lingo. And so first we're gonna talk about looking at maintenance therapies or continuous therapy in the setting of disease recurrence. So in this maroon box, disease recurs. We treat with a standard therapy in our trials. When we look at maintenance therapy, we then can treat patients with a maintenance therapy, and it may be continuation of the prior therapy or something called switch maintenance to a new therapy. And that's typically compared to a placebo here in the pink box. Now we follow patients and when the disease comes back, that's their recurrence. The time from where they, they ended the first treatment and the disease coming back, that's what's known as progression-free survival. So for here, you can see this maintenance therapy does better than the placebo, which has a smaller arrow. We also look at something called time to first subsequent therapy, which is literally the time from when this treatment ends to the next new treatment after the maintenance therapy, and the overall survival, how long a patient goes after multiple treatments until unfortunately they pass to see can we improve 
the cure rates of this disease. Now, this time to first subsequent therapy is a bit of a curious one, and I'm going to explain to you why we need to do it. So this is something to consider. Say we do a trial and we look at maintenance therapy versus placebo, and we're looking at a progression-free survival is what we would call the primary endpoint to see, is this active? Is it something we should consider? And you can see if this hypothetical trial were to work out, if you compared progression-free survival for the maintenance therapy, which is this long arrow, to the placebo, which is this shorter arrow, it looks pretty good. You can say, wow, this drug improves progression-free survival, and drugs are being approved based on this alone. But I would say, well, not so fast. This group, the maintenance therapy group, got an extra line of treatment. What if after that patients in the placebo group were able to get that treatment? So now we add that therapy at the time of recurrence. So a treatment therapy, not prevention maintenance, but at the time of recurrence, even if it doesn't work as well, it may add to that progression-free survival. So now the time to the first subsequent therapy for both sides, placebo versus maintenance, are exactly the same. And so we need to consider this because then the survival is gonna be exactly the same. And so this would suggest it's an important therapy, but not necessarily needed as maintenance. And so I wanna keep that in the back of our minds. All right, so the first trials we're gonna look at are in disease recurrence. Um, and these are older trials. In these trials, patients had recurrent disease. They got treated with chemotherapy. We monitored their response rates. And those patients who were responding or at least stable disease continued either on that same chemotherapy or they were given a placebo. And in these studies, they looked at progression-free survival, overall survival, and response rates. And so this is a table, just two trials were done looking at this. We haven't really done a lot of this in ovarian cancer. Um, and so these are pretty old trials with pretty old drugs, um, but they're still active drugs. The key thing to take away from this is if you look into these two trials, the response rates actually, if you haven't responded by five or six trials, five or six cycles, you're not gonna respond by 10 or 12. And so the response rates are essentially identical. What is key is that the overall survival was exactly the same. So this p-value tells you what are the likelihoods that this was this happened by chance. And so here there was a 45% chance this was this trial happened just by chance. We want p-values to be less than 0.05 so that they're unlikely to be by chance. This was a flip of a coin. So basically these two regimens are exactly the same. But you'll note when you get more chemotherapy, as all my patients know, the more chemo, the more toxicity suppression of the bone marrow, risk of infections, hospitalizations for neutropenic fevers, damage to the nerves, damage to the kidneys. So it was concluded very early that more chemo is not better. You get more toxicity without improving survival. And so we do not treat with extended chemotherapy for recurrent disease, or we should not. We see this a lot. And if you out there are getting extended chemotherapy, this is something you should discuss with your doctors. What about other cancers? Can we infer? We've only done a couple trials in ovarian cancer. Can we infer? So colon cancer, I think, is one of the, the, the disease sites where they've done the best. This is something called a meta-analysis, where we look at the results of multiple trials. So on the left, these are various trials that were done, and they all have cute names. Um, and on the right is something we call forest plot. Um, and so what they do is they look at what's called the hazard ratio, so the risk of something being beneficial or harmful. And the line down the middle is one, saying that it had no effect. And so if you look at this, the, the green squares are the average from each trial, but the blue lines are the confidence intervals, meaning was it statistically significant? And if it crosses that center line, it wasn't. And what you can see when you go through all these trials, these were not statistically significant, any of these studies. And when you average them all out in this big meta-analysis, combining all of these trials, the pink square is that average, and again, it crosses one, suggesting, as the authors concluded, that these intermittent strategies, giving chemotherapy breaks, does not negatively impact overall survival. And so this is something where we can, again, we can discuss with patients so they can know if you want to take a break, it won't impact your overall survival if done correctly. This is another one of these meta-analysis. This is in prostate cancer. I'm just gonna briefly show, again, the force plots. They all cross that center line with the medians coming right, the, the average coming right on one. So this is, the authors conclude from this meta-analysis that this is using hormonal therapy in prostate cancer. Again, is not inferior to continuous therapy, which is just fancy statistics speak for saying they're essentially the same. And you can take breaks from therapy and that often will improve your quality of life. I will throw a caveat out there, especially since this is a breast and ovarian cancer uh, group, that there were there was a recent meta-analysis um, 
actually not so recent anymore, in breast cancer. And in breast cancer, there were a couple of trials that actually don't cross that one. So that when you look at the average, there is a slight benefit to using continuous chemotherapy. Um, the authors conclude that there's a marginal benefit. And so this is where, again, you're gonna to wanna to have a conversation with your doctors to discuss, is there a benefit to you know, reducing those side effects? And it's really those high risk patients that might benefit from continuing. And a lot of patients who are low risk can take a break. So this is my first conclusion. If you look at chemotherapy in the setting of recurrent disease, continuous, is there any benefit for chemotherapy? And the answer is no. In ovarian cancer, there is no data to support the use of continuous 10, 12, 15 cycles of chemotherapy. Um, and you can safely take a break without risking overall survival. And so this is my, my visual reminder. So this is, uh, I'm a big fan of Hamilton. Actually, my daughter's a big fan, which makes me a big fan. And in this scene, Eliza is begging Alexander Hamilton to, to take a break for the summer quit working so hard, take a break. And uh, and he doesn't, and it ends up being his downfall. I won't do the spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. But um, we should consider better than Alexander did. You know, if it's June, you've been on six cycles of chemotherapy, you've had a response. If you want to take a break and go on vacation, or if it's cold and you want to go south for the, for the winter and you're in a nice partial or complete response, taking a break is perfectly reasonable. All right. So what about maintenance chemotherapy after the initial therapy? So this was called adjuvant therapy for not for patients who's recurred, but patients who have recently diagnosed, they have their surgery and chemotherapy combination, they get a response. And the question is, should we put patients on chemotherapy maintenance here? Trials have looked at profession-free survival and overall survival. And this is a big table, um, not for anybody to read all the lines, but I highlight a red box here just to show you. So there've been lots of trials. So this has really been a holy grail in ovarian cancer is can we try to improve outcomes of patients by extending therapy to try to either give a different chemo to kill whatever chemotherapy cell, whatever resistant cells are left, or what can we do to make patients live longer? And there've been a lot of trials. And what I'll just show you is over here in the red box, wherever it says NS, that means non-statistically significant, meaning there was no benefit. There are a few things here where there was a benefit in progression-free survival, but not in overall survival. So at the end of the day, all these studies going back to 1993 are negative trials showing the addition of chemotherapy, various cytokines, et cetera, have not improved outcomes. And just to show you, to make my point, so this was a trial up front in the red box here, looking at a study of platinum up front. So patients got either six cycles of a cisplatin-based regimen or 12. And what you can see is adding lots of extra chemo improves the progression-free survival. So that first arrow we were looking at, but when you look at overall survival, it doesn't make a difference. Multiple trials here, they tried adding topotecan after taxol carboplatin, no difference. Adding various taxol derivatives, acts of taxol carbo, improved progression-free survival, but no statistically significant difference in overall survival. And when you add the extra chemotherapy, you get a decreased quality of life, increased neuropathy in this particular study. And so there's really no benefit here. Um, this is just to introduce you to what's called an overall survival curve. This is the study where they were looking at taxol carboplatin followed by a switch maintenance to topotecan to see if this new drug could eradicate cancer cells. The way this plot works is Kaplan-Meier curve. As they look at the number of patients, in this case on the right, who are alive, um, when they start the trial, everybody's alive 100%. And then at each time a patient dies, it drops a line. So here you can see at 12 months, maybe 90% of patients are alive and you follow this. The different lines are the two different treatment groups and you can see that there's absolutely no difference in the survival. And in this case, the progression-free survival when you add the additional chemotherapy. So conclusion number two is extended adjuvant chemotherapy in ovarian cancer is not supported by the literature. It's not scientifically sound. It does not improve how long patients live and it adds lots of toxicity. So why is that? Um, and, and so what I think is that giving extended chemotherapy, additional chemotherapy is essentially giving the second line of therapy early. And what that does, the risk of that is for those patients who are cured, right? We're gonna cure some of those patients. They're gonna get chemotherapy unnecessarily and get toxicities. For those patients whose cancer is gonna recur no matter after that chemotherapy whose cancer is going to come back, it means that more chemotherapy can't get rid of it. And so basically you're giving second line therapy early. So imagine here, this is an important trial done by uh, Gordon Rustin, where patients were randomized, they got, they got chemotherapy, 
those patients who got a complete response were randomized to either have chemotherapy as soon as their CA125, their tumor marker, started to, to rise, or in a blinded fashion, some patients, when their CA125 started to rise, patients and doctors weren't told, and they waited and they were treated only when a patient had disease symptoms. And so this is what was called early chemotherapy, and this was delayed chemotherapy. And what you can see on the right in this survival analysis is that by having your chemotherapy delayed, it did not impact overall survival at all. But importantly, um, if you look at other endpoints, the time to third line treatment or death, so the amount of chemotherapy you're getting, is actually decreased in the delayed group. And if you look at the global health, so your quality of life, patients who had delayed chemotherapy had a better quality of life for a longer window of time, and they ultimately had less chemotherapy in their lives and less toxicity. So I should probably put in conclusion three there, um, but again, extended chemotherapy isn't going to help. So what about biologic therapies? I'm going to talk about endocrine therapies, antiangiogenics, and then PERP inhibitors, which are the newest class of drugs. So adjuvant hormonal therapy. So this is something that doesn't get discussed a lot. This was a trial that was done in Europe, but I really think our patients need to know about this and talk about it with their doctors more. Um, in this trial, patients were given the upfront chemotherapy and surgery, and then they were randomized either to adjuvant hormonal therapy, AHTX, or to placebo. And what you can see here is the patients who got adjuvant hormonal therapy. This is an overall survival, how many are alive at different time. You can see at 15 years, there's a huge improvement in the number of patients who are alive if they were treated with adjuvant hormonal therapy versus the placebo control. There were about 150 patients in this trial. They were, majority were advanced stage. The majority were high grade serous. There aren't a lot of criticisms in this trial, but some people say, well, maybe it was all the low-grade patients responding. We knew though that low-grade low -grade cancers respond better to hormonal therapy, um, but this is something that needs to be considered. If you consider another one of these meta-analysis looking at multiple trials, either and this is combining either hormone therapies kind of frontline or as a subsequent recurrent therapy, what you can see is on average, again, this red uh, diamond does not cross one. And that suggests that adjuvant hormonal therapies actually improve overall survival. Um, now, there aren't a lot of studies, so the authors conclude that it's worth considering and suggest bigger clinical trials. That probably needs to be done, but I don't know if that's ever going to happen, to be frank. Um, one of the critiques of those studies is a lot of low-grade serous cancers, as I mentioned, were in some of those trials. So this is a retrospective trial where they looked only at high-grade serous cancers. And this is from Stanley et al., and they looked at responses and they did it based on either an ER score, estrogen receptor expression score, or your disease response. And what they found was that even in patients, so if they patients, they all had carboplatin taxol, even if they had progressive disease in response to their carboplatin and taxol, they still could respond with 50% of patients responding for three months to endocrine therapy. If patients had stable disease or even better a, a response, either partial or complete, you can see those patients who had a good response to platinum and taxol more than 50% were still on hormonal therapy 24 months later. So they're really showing a significant benefit and showing that this isn't just random cherry picking of patients, their CA125s actually decline. There's more of a decline if you have a better ER expression, um, but this was seen across all groups. One of the knocks on that is, well, it's a retrospective trial. It's not truly randomized. And so there are no good randomized trials. Um, that I can cite, but I will cite this smaller trial where they randomized patients after chemotherapy to either an immune therapy, something called epicatastat, and that was supposed to be the experimental arm, or tamoxifen, which was supposed to be the kind of placebo control, if you will. And what they saw in this study was not only did the epicatastat do not do better, the tamoxifen did better. And so this is a small number, and it's hard to conclude, and the p-value was not statistically significant, so they're probably roughly the same. But if you look at the CA125, this is called a waterfall plot. Arrows going down say the CA125 decreased. If the bar goes up, says it's increased. What you can see is in the epicatastat arm, five out of 22 patients had a response with a declining CA125, whereas more than half of, this, uh, of the tamoxifen patients actually had a decline in their CA125. Again, supporting that this is actually an active agent. So my feeling is that endocrine therapy, kind of conclusion three or four, wherever we're at, it is definitely worth discussing in the adjuvant setting. We're never going to see a repeat of that EELS trial, but I think it worth, it's worth being discussed. 
that clearly has activity and recurrent disease, works better for patients who are ER positive, but certainly can be active if they're ER negative. Um, and so I don't even bother checking, I just put patients on it and see if it works. This is really important because it allows a break from chemotherapy because these are very non-toxic therapies and allows patients bone marrow to recover, et cetera, um, and they can feel well for a long time. All right, what about anti-angiogenics? So this is a class of drugs that block blood vessel growth in theory. And the idea is if a tumor can't grow a blood vessel, it can't grow bigger. Um, there have been a lot of studies, um, and I've talked about this a lot in the past, so I'm just gonna summarize this in one big slide. What you can see, there are a lot of studies with either bevacizumab, which is an antibody, or to a bunch of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, such as pizopinib, nintendinib, sidirinib. These are drugs which block the receptor for a growth factor. And what they've all shown here is that they all improve progression-free survival, that first arrow, which I told us to be caution of, but most of these studies did not improve overall survival. There are a couple caveats, and these are important. For adjuvant therapy, so when patients are treated initially after initial surgery and chemotherapy, for patients who are in a very high risk group, patients with stage four disease, or patients who have a difficulty having all their tumor removed at surgery, something called suboptimal debulking, these patients appear to have a benefit for bevacizumab, and those are the patients who we should be considering this in. None of the other patients have that advantage. And so this is just uh, the survival curve showing that. So this is from GOG 218, which was recently updated and published. Um, in the blue lines here are the stage four patients. So stage four patients who got bevacizumab with maintenance versus the dashed lines, you can see those patients do much better than the controlled patients and that improves their overall survival. So I think these patients are definitely worth considering bevacizumab in. For patients in black, if you look in that black lines, all those curves overlap. There is no improvement in overall survival, no dent in survival for patients who get additional bevacizumab. And those are patients who are stage three disease, who are optimally debulked, and they should not be receiving bevacizumab in my opinion. Uh, so this is probably conclusion number four. Uh, bevacizumab upfront should not be broadly used. I think it should be used in patients who are suboptimally debulked or stage four disease. The role in the maintenance for recurrent setting is controversial. Um, I can go back. There was one trial that showed a benefit of chemotherapy, the other of bevacizumab. The others did not. It is a good drug. It is active in recurrent disease, and it is something that I consider. I usually use it more as treatment than as maintenance. Um, but there was one trial to support it, though it was controversial with some funny math, if you will. All, all right, what about PARP inhibitors? These are the newest drugs. Um, and these are the drugs I think patients have the most questions about, and they've kind of uh, a lot of work still to be done. We'll talk about PARP inhibitors in recurrent disease. So again, for patients who have had disease come back, is it active there? And she'll be using it as maintenance and then as adjuvant therapy immediately up front after um, chemotherapy and surgery when they've first been diagnosed. So this is a big table again, so you don't have to go through all the details, but I'll highlight in teal here. <clears throat> multiple studies with three different drugs now that are clinically approved with a fourth one waiting in the wings, um, that all of these studies, when we look at patients treated with PARP inhibitors, they're called uh, poly-ADP ripose polymerase inhibitors or PARP inhibitors, they were designed specifically to treat patients with BRCA mutations, BRCA mutations, and what we found is that it's active, very active in those patients, but it's also active for patients who don't have BRCA mutations for various reasons. So when we've looked in various trials in this teal box, they all have a p-value of less than 0.1 or 0.05. And so they all statistically significantly to a trial show an improvement in progression-free survival. But again, we've been burned by that progression-free survival. So overall survival is what I really care about. So only one trial to date is looked at and reported on overall survival. And that was this top study, study 19, which was one of the first. Now this trial wasn't powered, so there weren't necessarily enough patients to show a statistical significance in overall survival, but I will say it was not a small trial. There were 265 patients in this trial. This wasn't like a 40 patient trial. And what you can see is the overall survival was not statistically significant between the placebo um, and, the, and the PARP inhibitor treated group for overall survival. Patients who were BRCA mutation wild type, so who don't have the BRCA mutations, they really showed no significant improvement. 
Patients who are mutation carriers seem to do a little better. Again, not statistically significant, but the numbers are starting to separate that maybe there's something there. I will mention that the PARP group, there were real side effects. So these drugs are not without their side effects. 22% of patients had a grade three or four adverse event. 75% have nausea, grade one or grade two, mild nausea. And about 1% get um, some form of a bone marrow disease known as MDS or acute myeloid leukemia. All right, so I want to go back to that progression-free survival, right? Because everything we're talking about with the PARP inhibitors is progression-free survival. And I want to remind you of that something to consider trial. What if we'd done our trials differently? What if we'd looked at PARP as maintenance versus placebo and then treating with PARP when the disease recurs? Could we treat with PARPs later? Patients would get less PARPs, would have less toxicity, less financial toxicity, and they might get the same outcome. And so I'm going to walk you through um, what I'm going to call a thought experiment. So I'm going to take two studies, two different uh, studies, study 19 and study 42. They both use the same drug. We'll talk about patients who are BRCA mutation carriers. Study 19 was a maintenance trial. So patients got this as soon as they finished their chemotherapy or within eight weeks of finishing their chemotherapy. If they had a complete or partial response, they started it as a maintenance therapy. Study 42 was a study earlier on where they just treated patients at the time of recurrence. So this was a treatment study, not maintenance. And I want you to imagine two twin sisters, identical, identical twins. They are BRCA mutation carriers, and they both develop ovarian cancer, the exact same age. Everything about them is identical. They both enroll in study 19. Sister number one gets randomized to the Olaparib, the PARP inhibitor, maintenance. Now, she is a perfect median patient. She goes, she's a BRCA mutation carrier and the BRCA mutation carriers on average had an 11.2 month progression free survival. So that's what she gets exactly. Sister number two is disappointed. She gets randomized to the placebo arm. Patients on the placebo, they had 4.3 months progression free survival before their disease came back on the placebo. So she's at 4.3 months. At that time, she now enrolls in study 42, which is a treatment study. In there, she now would get the median duration response of 7.9 months. So now if you consider the two sisters, who did better? Sister number one had PARP treatment. She was on PARP treatment for 11 months and she had 11.2 month progression free survival. Sister number two was on PARP treatment for eight months and she had a 12.2 month progression free or time to first subsequent therapy of 12.2 months. And that's where that time to first subsequent therapy is important. So this patient gets less drug, less toxicity, less cost, and she actually clinically might do a little bit better. Now this is hypothetical, it hasn't been proven, but I think it's really important to ask, do we need to start these drugs as maintenance or can we just use them as a treatment at the time of recurrence? And this is a clinical trial that uh, Dr. Sarah Taylor here at the McGee Women's Hospital and UPMC Hillman Cancer Center is actually hoping to initiate early in 2020 where we will directly compare a study 19 type trial design where PARP inhibitors are used as maintenance versus saying, can we watch patients until they show signs of relapse and then start the PARP inhibitor treatment and see if by delaying treatment, much like in that study I showed you with delayed chemotherapy, if we delay PARP inhibitor treatment, can we reduce the amount of drug patients get, reduce their toxicities, reduce costs and actually make patients do better in their time to their first subsequent therapy. All right, <clears throat> so the last topic I'll study is talk about is what about in the adjuvant setting? So this means right up front, patients get treated, surgery, chemotherapy, and then they start PARP inhibitor maintenance immediately after their initial chemotherapy. There are a couple of trials, I only talk about SOLO1. There was another trial with a different agent, looks exactly the same to this one. Um, these are patients, only BRCA mutation patients. They get surgery and chemotherapy, and then within eight weeks of completing their chemotherapy, if they have a CR or a PR, they get randomized to drug versus placebo. What you can see from these overall survival curves is, or, I'm sorry, this is a progression-free survival curve that you can see there is a huge benefit to the PARP inhibitor here. Very, very big benefit. So this is very encouraging. However, I'm a pragmatist um, and I'm a scientist, so I want proof. Um, and there are a couple things that we need to consider in this trial. First of all, the progression-free survival and the placebo control here is what I would say is significantly lower than expected. So the progression-free survival by this trial, you need to add a bump because of the time of additional four months of chemotherapy 
but the progression free survival here will say on average is coming out in about 17 months, under 18 months. And the most recent kind of big trials of bevacizumab, the median overall survival was 20 months and 22 months. So this is four months less. And traditionally the BRCA mutation carrier patients actually do better. They're more responsive to chemotherapy. So I would have expected this number to be more like 26 or 27. So I'm a little bit surprised by that. Now, what if we kind of say, what if this is just a time to first subsequent therapy question? Um, if you treated these patients at recurrence based on a trial called SOLO2, you'd get about a 20 month duration of response from that. So if we add an arrow adding 20 months to here, it still looks like this curve is beating where I would expect those patients to be. But again, with that caveat that I would expect that this um, progression free survival to be even better. And now if it, you add another six months, they're getting pretty close. However, I'm not a naysayer per se. I don't wanna be a negative Nelly. They did do some nice secondary endpoints in this trial and they looked at the time to first subsequent therapy or death, and there's a real big improvement. And if this number holds up, then I would say there probably is really gonna be a benefit here. And I'm very hopeful that there is. Similarly, the progression-free survival two, which is how long do you go without progressing after your second therapy, also appears to be much better. These are all statistically significant. And we're gonna have a couple of trials here looking at this. And so I'm very optimistic for patients who are upfront, adjuvant therapy who are BRCA mutation carriers, that this will be of benefit. And so I will summarize there for the PARP inhibitors in the recurrent disease setting, these drugs are clearly active. They're drugs we need to be using for our patients, but they're also expensive. Um, and so we need to ask the question for these patients, do we need to use maintenance or can we use treatment just as a treatment at the time of recurrence? And that's an ongoing question. In the adjuvant setting, when patients are initially diagnosed, they should be considered for patients who are BRCA mutation carriers, not for all patients. And this still needs to be a thoughtful discussion because it's still not definitive. Um, there is no data for non-BRCA mutation carriers and so they should not be used there. Lastly, I wanna talk about on the right, what makes a good maintenance therapy? So if you consider the PARP inhibitors, is it easy slash oral? Check, it does. Is it low cost? No, these drugs cost between ten dollars and $15,000 a month. So that's a real problem if we're going to ask patients to stay on these drugs for two, three years. This is a long time to be on a very expensive drug. Effective, I'm going to say probably, but it gets a question mark because we haven't proven a benefit on overall survival, and I'd really like to see that, and we're going to have to wait a few years for that. And does it have low side effects? I'll say kind of. Um, many patients tolerate this very well. It is much easier to take a PARP inhibitor than chemotherapy. Um, but there are side effects, there are things to manage, docs need to be paying attention in managing these side effects. There can be significant fatigue and nausea, diarrhea, other comp problems that aren't fun to live with. And so I'm gonna give that a kinda. So the PARPs aren't perfect, we're waiting, waiting for more data, but I am at least optimistic for the BRC mutation carriers that we can do something there. And with that, I'm gonna finish. Um, and I'll say first, thank you to the audience for listening. Um, and I always like to thank the patients and families that I interact with that make my job um, that give passion to my life and my job, and uh, thank everybody for listening. Okay, so now let's start the Q&A. I want to remind everybody that if you look on the question page on your screen, you can enter questions there, and we'll be looking to see if there's any questions submitted. Um, and um, we'll try to get through all the submitted questions, but we may not get through all of them due to uh, time constraints. Um, oh, and please try to keep your questions general in nature. And we'll start with Andrea who has a couple questions. <clears throat> uh, doctor, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, my experience on the helpline tells me that some women who are being who are on PARP inhibitors are being told uh, to give it a bit of a chance that uh, by month two uh, the side effects may lessen over time. Has that been your experience? That is true. Um, so the body will do something called tachyphylaxing, where the body gets kind of used to the drug and will adjust. And so it certainly is true um, that patients will do better um, and get more used to the side effects, if you will, over time, or some of them will dissipate. Um, but not all of them do. Um, and this is where there is no harm in a dose reduction as well. And so sometimes we can dose reduce, and then if docs want to then increase the drug once the patients are more, are more uh, tolerating that medication, that is also something to consider, depending on how bad the side effects are. If it's nausea, we can manage that with a little compazine or something simple. We certainly um, can try to manage that. 
um, patients who are having severe diarrhea and can't leave the house, right, that needs a dose reduction. I would say, depending on these drugs, some cause severe anemia, some cause liver side effects, and those will require dose reductions. I think sometimes docs, we get lazy or we're not paying attention enough, um, and this requires a little more, these drugs aren't as benign as, you know, starting, you know, an aspirin, which also has side effects, but these, these drugs have side effects, and so we need to manage them, and we can manage them with dose reductions, and you can reduce and then increase the dose later if, if we think, you know, the, uh, we've gotten used to the side effects or tachyphylax. But yes, long answer is yes. <laughs> okay. And um, now as genomic testing becomes more and more prevalent, if a tumor shows uh, homologous recombination deficiency, HRD, uh, I'm also told that that's, you know, the doctors are throwing PARPs at, tho at those uh, conditions as well as the BRCA germline and somatic mutations. Yes. And, and so yeah. the PARP inhibitors, I mean, it actually, the number one predictor of response outside of everything is whether the patient is still platinum sensitive. Did their tumor respond to a platinum-based chemotherapy and not recur within six months? And so you don't even necessarily need the fancy genomic testing. Um, some would say that 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 alone really is a predictor of response to um, a PARP inhibitor. And so that alone can be enough. That said, patients who are platinum resistant still do respond. And there are studies comparing patients who are non-homologous recombination deficient, HRD deficient, and BRCA mutation carriers. The BRCA mutation carriers clearly do the best. Those that have an HRD score suggesting they are HRD um, deficient will do a little bit better than those who do not. It's not a huge difference, and in my general feeling is with or without it, it's not going to stop me from trying that medication to see if it will work. Um, if patients are HR, have an HRD score, they are slightly more likely to respond. And so if you have it and your doctors say, hey, you're HRD deficient and let's try this, it's a fine idea, but I don't need it to start the drug. Thank you. Okay. Um, so our first question that was just submitted now is, uh, can you talk about therapies for low grade and, and how that uh, taking breaks or any of these topics might be different for yes. that group? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. So the low grades are almost a completely different cancer, to be honest, and we need to consider them completely differently. Um, and I would say the number one thing with the low grade cancers is they are much more responsive to hormonal therapies. And because the hormonal therapies are so well tolerated, we will often put a patient on a hormonal therapy and leave them there as maintenance for as long as they can tolerate it. So if patients have a low grade tumor and we start that patient on an aromatase inhibitor um, and that patient is on and responding at six months, I'm not gonna stop that patient at six months because they're on, they are on a chemotherapy holiday, right? They're not receiving chemotherapy. And typically with a low grade tumors, what we will try to do is juggle some of those therapies from one hormonal or endocrine-based therapy to a different hormonal endocrine-based therapy, a little bit more like we would do in breast cancer by switching the class, um, switching the activities, and alternating some of those therapies for as long as we can. I will say, well, not extensively studied bevacizumab anecdotally is active in low-grade tumors. I found it can work quite well in low-grade tumors. Um, there are other um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, some other medications that have been studied when they progress, but I would say that the hormonal, the endocrine-based therapies for low-grade tumors are much more commonly used, and in that case, I am more likely to leave a patient on that treatment and not stop just because they're so well-tolerated. Okay, and someone asks, how do you determine timing of a treatment break? So great question. Um, and this is one thing where I think some of the docs don't always understand when I'm discussing a treatment break. So the patients who are going to do best with a treatment break are the patients who have just had a partial response of some sort. So if a patient goes on a chemotherapy and we treat them for three months, and unfortunately at three months their tumor is regrowing and is getting bigger even on that chemotherapy, it's very difficult time to stop and, 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 and just take a, a big holiday likely then we need to switch to a different chemotherapy. We need to find a different medication that's working because if the cancer is growing well on chemotherapy, when we stop, it's going to keep growing and probably grow faster. So that is not the time to take a break. The best time to take a break is when the patients have lower tumor burden or disease volume, if you will. So if I start a patient on doxel or one of these agents, 
and we get a partial response, as I showed with the CN125 and the hormonal therapy, if you get a partial response and somebody's got, say, disease in their lymph nodes, but it's not very big, nobody dies of disease in their lymph nodes. We can take a break and then either start an endocrine therapy or monitor them and do nothing and watch and see. Will the disease come back ultimately? Yes. Could I restart that exact same chemotherapy they were just on? I can't. They're not necessarily going to be resistant because if I stopped because I chose to stop, it's very different than if I stopped because it wasn't working. So many times I will go back and reuse that same regimen. And so the patients who have just had a, a clinical response, partial or complete, are the best time to take a chemotherapy holiday. Stable disease, we can still take a chemotherapy holiday. I'm going to have them come back a little bit closer. I'm not going to wait three months. I'm going to have them come back quicker or maybe just check a C125 in a month to make sure the disease is not rapidly growing. But those are also patients you can take a break in. So timing is important. It's a great question. Okay. And also um, somebody asked, what would you consider a break? Um, I, it seems like you were just saying it can be different lengths of time, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Time wise. So the timeline, so, you know, if you go by the trial I presented, we probably don't have to, we can not treat somebody until they have symptoms, um, but I will admit that I would prefer to treat somebody just before they had symptoms so I can prevent symptoms. And so I will typically follow a CA125, depending on the patient and how well they responded, every two months or so, sometimes every month, depending on that patient, and then we'll follow. The key things are symptoms. What I tell my patients, I often don't scan folks, but basically the chemotherapy break and how long we take a break is going to depend a little bit on how well they're doing. So some patients, I'll have them come away, and two months later, if the CA125 is rising, we'll kind of recheck it. If it's really going up and they have symptoms, we're going to restart therapy. So there is no defined break where I'm going to give you three months and then have you come back, but I'm pretty much going to wait till I have evidence of the disease kind of regrowing and those two, the two markers that I need are patient symptoms. They're by far the number one sign because patients always know when their cancer is back and then CA125. And if something's disparate, maybe the number's going down, but the patient says, I don't feel good. That's when I'll get a CAT scan as a tiebreaker to make sure it's not that they're not feeling good because they've got, you know, some other illness and it's actually the cancer. Um, so it's not, there's no clear definition of how long we take a break. Typically, a minimum is two months. Uh, I can usually get patients time to go away for a holiday, you know, go go somewhere warm, you know, in January, February, those kind of things. But um, each patient needs to be managed uh, individually. This is where, where where the art of medicine comes in, rather than kind of having a, a clear script to follow. Okay. And somebody asks, is it advisable or acceptable to allow a patient on a PARP to take a brief break? Yep. Sometimes, yep. or some, they mentioned that sometimes platelets are an issue for them, and and uh, I think that's maybe why they bring that up. Yep, yep. And so, d particularly depending on the class of drugs, but they all can cause platelets. Um, one of the PARP inhibitors is, is much worse than the other in, in causing low platelets, also known as thrombocytopenia. But absolutely, if patients are experiencing problems with low platelets, um, you know, if if you have, you know, so without platelets, you can have a, a bleed or a stroke or other things. And so, you know, if we kill you trying to cure you, we haven't done you any favors. So when patients have low platelets, we definitely want to hold the drug. We want to take a break. You can then go back to it, typically if the platelets are low enough, at a lower dose. And so this is where, again, managing the dose um, of these things, we're still working out some of the kinks. Um, and so clearly dose reductions were built into the scientific protocols and they need to be considered um, because the dose for these drugs is not one size fits all. And I've had several patients who've required dose reductions, and then we get them on the right dose, do very well for a very long time. Um, and so some patients are just more sensitive than others. And if the platelets are really low, absolutely, we would take a break. Or if the hemoglobin's low, white counts are too low, take a break and restart them. And depending on how low it was, we'd restart potentially at a lower dose. Okay. <clears throat> um, let's see. The, how do you weigh a doctor's push for treatment or, yeah, I mean, I'm just going to word it the way it was submitted. How do you weigh a, a doctor's push for treatment uh, versus quality of life concerns? Or I guess it's sort of like treatment uh, recommendations versus quality of life. Sure. 
Um, and so this is where ultimately the patient's always in charge, I will say. Quality of life matters and nobody can make you take chemotherapy. Um, will I sometimes twist a patient's arm if I really think it's in their best benefit? Yes, but I think that this is where you know, discussions need to be had in, in discussing what are the actual benefits? What are the chances of responding to the next therapy? And then also how many lines of therapy? So occasionally I'll have a patient who's a little bit reluctant. Sometimes patients don't know a lot about the chemotherapy or they've heard, oh, my neighbor had chemo and they had his terrible response. Well, everybody's different. You need to kind of put that aside. If there's ever a question, one thing you can do is you can, you could try a month or two. So you could try the treatment and say, at two months, if you hate it and it's terrible and you think the quality of life is low, then stop. Nobody can make you take chemotherapy. Quality of life matters and everybody has to make their own value kind of judgment call on the risks and the benefits. And some people evaluate the risks more than the benefits and vice versa. And so this is where, you know, ultimately patients need to decide have the information and really discuss with their doctors what are the benefits and what are the risks so you can make an informed decision. Um, but that you know, that's difficult if there's ever really a question. Any doctor worth their salt does not mind you getting a second opinion. Um, I advise my patients to get second opinions all the time because you need to be confident in your doctor. And so if you're really unclear on what you wanna do, get a second opinion. Great. Um, are there lab results that might indicate a good time to take a break? You sort of spoke to that a little bit, but that was one of the questions. So if you can speak to that a little bit more. Yep. I would say there are kind of two, two big things that drive my decision when to take a break. So one is obviously if we've had a response with a really nice decline in the CA125 as a marker of the disease, CA125 works for about 80 up to 90% of patients, and it's very specific when it goes down that the cancer is declining. And so if we've had a really nice response, CA125 comes down, that's a great time to consider a break. The other time I will consider a break is say I have a patient on chemotherapy and they've had a partial response. There's still tumor there, but it's shrunk a little bit. But now they've been on a lot of chemotherapy and their bone marrow can't tolerate more chemotherapy. So we're running into those problems of platelets being too low, white counts being too low, severe anemia, things that are hard to manage, particularly the low platelets or the low white counts. That's also a good time to consider a break. If we give a break and let the bone marrow recover, the patient may actually tolerate that next line of therapy much better. You know, I've seen patients in second opinion who have taken, you know, 14 months of chemotherapy in a row and when the disease starts to grow, now, when we try to switch chemotherapies to something different, they just can't take it because their bone marrow has been so beat up by all that chemotherapy, they just can't tolerate anymore, and it becomes a real problem. And so when patients have had a partial response and they're showing signs of intolerance of the chemo due to low um, blood counts, that's a really good time to consider a break. Okay, great. Um, and then... Just a few more questions. Um, what is there an optimal timing of breaks and sequencing of treatments or trials? Yeah, so that that is unknown. We've tried a couple studies trying to see compare the sequencing of different um, chemotherapies, chemo sequencing gemcitabine versus doxel and topotecan and some of those different drugs, and the sequence doesn't seem to matter. To be frank. Um, when patients are platinum sensitive, they benefit the most from platinum. After that, sequencing probably doesn't matter. Um, you can even go back to the platinum sometime. So this is where, again, the art of medicine comes in and the sequencing and what you pick next is all about the patient. So if a patient has significant neuropathy, I'm not gonna pick a taxane. Um, if patients have heart is issues, I'm not gonna pick, you know, doxyl or something adriamycin-based that can cause cardiotoxicity. Um, you know, we consider kidney toxicity. All those things need to be considered when considering the next uh, chemotherapy choice. And so there is no right answer as to the sequence of things. Um, and when to build in breaks, I build in breaks whenever I can. So sequencing chemotherapy versus the next line of PARP inhibitor or when would you use bevacizumab is really unclear. I often recommend saving bevacizumab till a little bit later than upfront because it's a nice drug to use when patients bone marrow and blood counts can't tolerate uh, chemotherapy because it is not toxic to the marrow. 
And so there are ways to combine that with mild chemotherapies and make it more effective. And so all those things need to be considered with each patient. But there is unfortunately no clear script where I can say every patient should get carbotaxol and then they should get chemo X, chemo Y, and chemo Z. There is no answer there and it all needs to be personalized. Okay. Um, and then we have two more questions um, that are not totally about breaks, but I, I definitely want to respect these questions and, and you, we're glad we have your ear still. So um, somebody says, what about those who have PDL1 mutations but are not BRCA positive? Is there a benefit to looking into tr uh, trying a PARP at the time of first recurrence? So, uh, okay, so two different questions there. So first I'll talk about the PARP at first recurrence. And so there are data that PARP inhibitors are active as a treatment at the time of recurrence. And, you know, my big question is, is it, it may be just as effective to use it as a, as a treatment as opposed to recurrence, as a maintenance and then recurrence. And so absolutely, PARPs can be considered as treatment, and I do that all the time. So if you've had chemotherapy, your disease has come back, particularly if it was a platinum-sensitive recurrence, and you want to start a PARP inhibitor as treatment, absolutely. All the first clinical trials in PARP inhibitors were treatment trials, and they were clearly effective. So yes. For patients, that, for tumors that are PDL1 positive, those are that's a marker of immunotherapy. So immune therapy and ovarian cancer is not um, approved yet. We do use them clinically in clinical trials and occasionally off-label. Patients who are PDL1 positive in a in a uh, critical trial presented by Ursula Macellonis looked at PDL1 as a marker of response. So in tumors like lung cancer, those who have some expression are more likely to respond. In ovarian cancer, it wasn't necessarily a predictor of response unless you had really high levels of expression. Those patients who had greater than 20, 30% expression had the best response. The response rates to checkpoint inhibitors and immune therapy for targeting PDL1 have been a little disappointing in ovarian cancer. And there's a lot of evidence suggesting that those drugs alone aren't going to make a difference, and we're going to have to combine it with other things, whether we combine it with a PARP inhibitor or bevacizumab or other novel approaches that are in clinical trial is still up in the air. It appears we can make those checkpoint inhibitors work better in combination, but used alone and just because of a PDL1 expression, the response rates are pretty low, and I would prefer to see a patient go on clinical trial than trying something willy-nilly, just saying, well, there's PDL1 expression and let's give it a try. Okay, so our last question is about patients who are not BRCA positive who have a recurrence, and they're wondering if a longer initial uh, progression-free survival has an impact on treatment decisions. Um, so a very good question, um, and it certainly does. Um, it's kind of prognostic, if you will. So the longer that initial progression-free survival is, the better. And so we know that the longer patients do, the better patients do. And it's kind of, it seems obvious, but the better you do, the better you do. So patients who get initial chemotherapy with carboplatinum and taxol and their tumor actually grows well on that chemotherapy, they're what we would call platinum refractory. And those patients, unfortunately, do by far the worst. Um, it is harder to get a response in those patients. We will switch to different chemotherapies. If you grow on carboplatin taxol, we can try some what would be called switch treatments um, to try something different, and some patients will respond. There's no clear answer as what to do. Those patients who recur within six months of finishing carboplatinum taxol um, but had some response, they're known as platinum resistant. Those patients can typically be treated with a different chemotherapy, or they can be treated with platinum and taxol given a different way, weekly instead of every three weeks. Um, and then obviously, if you go more than six months, you're platinum sensitive and you should be retreated with a platinum agent. But the, the, the progression-free survival interval, interval does tend to predict uh, how well we do, and that number tends to get shorter with each subsequent line of therapy. Okay, great. Thank you for answering all those questions. Um, I'm going to put the slides back to me and put up our slide here. Um, so, yeah, you should be able to see uh, that slide there. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much, Dr. Bukanovich. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing about Joan. And uh, thank you for the, everybody who submitted questions. Um, 
please take a moment to fill out the survey at the end, right after we close this, so a survey will pop up. And I also wanted to mention a upcoming webinar at the end of January, uh, Why Genetics is Increasingly Important. We have Dr. Modisit from the University of Virginia is going to be presenting about her research on genetics and also talking a little bit about genomics um, and how it's really an uh, important area for ovarian cancer patients specifically. So you can find out more about that on our website. Um, and we'll close it there. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely holiday and a happy new year. Thank you. Same to you.